Um, I think really Eric summed it all up. Brooklyn is in a great place. Development is happening. Uh, things are moving fast and they're moving well. Uh, the mayor's announcement yesterday of the housing piece is very exciting. But what excited me most about that announcement was the thought of housing and development and all of this happening not just in certain parts of the city. Uh, Eric mentioned Fourth Avenue, and I want to commend Pernima because she worked on that project as well. But Fourth Avenue looked at a part of Brooklyn that had subway access, had opportunity, um, had density, and had a place to build. And really, if you look at Fourth Avenue now, you see incredible buildings, new retail, new landscaping, new trees, people living there, shopping there, going to school there, a new public school followed. So these are the things that can happen when I think the industry comes together, the city comes together, and we really look at what's in the best interest of Brooklyn. Now, those of you that know me know I'm a southern Brooklyn boy. I live in Diker Heights. I'm not moving downtown, so Tucker, sorry if you're here. Um, and I continue to tell people that as we look at the future of Brooklyn, it's really not just one little part of the borough. As Eric said, East New York, uh, East Williamsburg. But I tell you, go even further south. Look at Sheepshead Bay. Think about it. We have a marina in Brooklyn. It's beautiful. We have a beach in Brooklyn. We have incredible Victorian homes in Bay Ridge and Ditmas Park and all these places. Look outside of the box. Think outside of the box. For those of you in the industry, don't just focus on one little pocket of Brooklyn. Focus on the entire borough. That's really our message, and it continues to be. Now, there are obstacles. Uh, there will always be challenges, but I am thrilled that we have a person to head this, uh, the Department of City Planning who is not just up for the challenge, but he has solved the challenges over and over and over again in his illustrious career. Carl Weisbrod was appointed the director of the New York City Planning by Mayor de Blasio uh, a very short time ago, and I think we will all agree this is probably one of the top two or three best decisions the mayor has made thus far. Uh, I won't say the first, because then I'll get a call from City Hall, but top three, definitely. Uh, Carl is a person that knows what it means to usher neighborhoods through periods of rapid changes, but more importantly, he knows how to work with the community, how to include the community, how to embrace the community, and how to make the community feel that they are not just a part of it on paper, but really a part of it in making the decisions. He has more than 35 years of experience serving all of us in New York City, both in the public and private sector. He served under the Lindsay, Koch, and Dinkins administrations, and he, he held several high-level roles by the Bloomberg administration. At a time, many of us remember when the city desperately needed it, um, particularly during the Giuliani and the Dinkins administration, Carl was the one that came in and got things done. He led the city's largest business improvement district as the founding president of the Alliance for Downtown New York. Um, many of us remember 42nd Street and Times Square. Uh, I remember going there as a kid. It was not a pretty place. Um, Carl Weisbrod is the man who made it happen, who really created an entire new community uh, and created a symbol for the world of the greatness of New York City. I'm not sure we're ready for Disney yet in Brooklyn, Carl, but you never know. Um, he managed the successful rezoning of Hudson Square into a dynamic mixed-use neighborhood for creative industries and new housing. By the way, exactly what we're looking for right here in Brooklyn. I think, Carl, you're perfect in every sense except one thing. We need you to move to Brooklyn. <laughs> So maybe today, Carl will announce that he's looking for a new place in Brooklyn, and then he will be a Brooklynite. But all kidding aside, this is really a man who understands this city. He understands government. He understands our industry. But more importantly, he understands the people that live and do business in these communities. And I think we're all excited to have Carl Weisbrod at the helm of city planning. So let's give a big Brooklyn welcome to Carl Weisbrod. Thank, th thank you so much, Carlo. Uh, um, you should have said the top 
15, top 20, you're going to cause me enormous problems. I just want you to know that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very good to be here, and I, I really uh, uh, appreciate what you have done in Brooklyn. I appreciate and thank uh, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce and Carlo, of course, and um, uh, Tara CRG uh, and uh, Oprah Cohen and uh, AbsonLofts.com, David Mondrell. And, and it's also terrific for me to be um, here and see so many old friends that I've made over the years. Um, I wish I could move to Brooklyn. I just can't afford it anymore. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to have much to say following uh, Borough President Eric Adams, who, who pretty much um, uh, summed it all up in a much more eloquent way than, than I could. And uh, his immortal lines of build, baby, build, build taller, build higher, but build is um, certainly uh, music to my ears, and um, I know music to the mayor's ears as well, um, and probably, I'm sure, music to the ears of, uh, of most of you. Um, I want to uh, perhaps uh, start by taking a look backward and then taking a, a look forward. I, I do remember, I remember when I was at the Economic Development Corporation, and even before that, uh, in a, a, a short uh, period of time when I was at city planning, and we were marketing MetroTech to the to businesses um, uh, to persuade them to try to persuade them to move to Brooklyn, and I I remember how we had to create um, special corridors and uh, bring out the police force en masse, uh, so and and sort of move people, uh, uh, potential employers, through those corridors so that they wouldn't see the environment around them and that uh, uh, hopefully we could persuade them to move to Brooklyn. And in fact, in some cases, we did. I know Hardy Adasco, Mike Weiss, uh, remembers uh, those days well, and I'm sure most of you, as most of you do. Um, you know, I hesitate to really date myself uh, when I really look backward, but my, my first conscious memory of Brooklyn was going to Ebbets Field as a four-year-old um, uh, Queens boy uh, to watch Jackie Robinson uh, play baseball and to discover, to my astonishment, that the field was green. Um, that was well before the days of color TV. <laughs> so. I grew up thinking that the field was gray. <laughs> um, um, and in those days, uh, uh, we have nostalgic memories of it, but in, in those days, uh, the Dodgers were perhaps a, a, a metaphor for the borough as a whole. They were, they were lovable, they were colorful, they were the object of fierce loyalty, but they were also, to a, a, an extent, uh, perhaps, a symbol of, of futility, that somehow they always found uh, extremely creative ways to lose and, uh, <laughs> playing, and playing second fiddle most of the time to their rivals in Manhattan and in the Bronx. Um, but as you all know, a lot has happened since then. Um, now Brooklyn is not only the center of gravity for the city, but it has a zeitgeist that is emulated and embraced across the country and around the world. Thanks in large measure to many of you in this room, Brooklyn has established its own distinct identity, becoming a center of vibrant culture, economic innovation, and political power, certainly now. Nationally and internationally, it has really emerged as a world-class brand and the place to be. From Hip Williamsburg and Greenpoint, to Techie Dumbo, to the surging 24-7 downtown Brooklyn with its mix of uses, including new housing, hotels, retail, and office towers. Who could have imagined this 25 years ago? To the family-oriented Park Slope, and to new housing and economic enterprises from Sunset Park to Crown Heights and Coney Island, Brooklyn's neighborhoods are leading the way in urban regeneration and innovation. And downtown Brooklyn and its neighborhoods adjacent to it are emblematic of this transformation. In the past decade, 
Downtown Brooklyn has seen over $5 billion in private investment, including over 8,300 new dwelling units, 1,600 new hotel rooms, 1.5 million square feet of new retail, and an expanding skyline that really is uh, totally amazing. Um, and while Brooklyn itself has a large and diverse immigrant population, we are in the midst of yet another phase we at City Planning know in our city's demographic history, one where domestic in-migration and natural growth, families staying in, uh, in place, in town, having children, becoming a larger factor in the increase in our population, and a lot of that as we all know, has really been due to the decrease in crime. And, and, uh, and, and a, t a tip of my hat to you, Mr. Borough President, for your, for your role in that. Um, and the data now shows that net migration to the city continues to be positive, meaning that more people are coming to New York City than leaving. More people are staying in New York City to start families. The diversity and growth of our population are among the major reason why the city's neighborhoods and its economy, with Brooklyn as a, the major driver, are flourishing. Brooklyn's growth has not only been confined to a few areas, but extends to all parts of the borough, from Bay Ridge to East New York, Bushwick to Coney Island. Uh, the borough's neighborhoods are surging uh, just since January. Some 3,600 new dwelling units have started. Um, retail corridors along 8th Avenue and Sunset Park, Fulton Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Church Avenue in Flatbush are bursting with activity. Who can really say that density uh, is bad? I mean, we are seeing the products of density um, emerge as a driver for much of this activity. And yet, this population increase underscores the need to spur the creation of housing for all New Yorkers and also to produce affordable housing for those whose enhanced prosperity has not kept pace with the rising cost of shelter, and especially for those who have not seen enhanced prosperity at all. Many communities and citizens in Brooklyn have been overwhelmed by the pace of change and have felt left out of this new Brooklyn that continues to envelop them. The same is true throughout the city. Income inequality, lack of affordable housing options, and unacceptable levels of unemployment continue to dog too many families. And that is why we are focusing on, in Mayor de Blasio's Housing New York plan, that is what we are focusing on in Mayor de Blasio's Housing New York plan, which he released yesterday. The de Blasio administration is committed to providing 200,000 affordable apartments over the next 10 years through both preservation and new development. So let me just talk a bit about what's contained in the plan. The 115-page plan which I hope you've all read between its release last night and this morning. It's a, it's a page turner. It will keep you up. It's, as I've suggested to Carlo, it's like war and peace. It really is. It's a compelling read. Um, was created through coordination with 13 city agencies and with input from more than 200 individual stakeholders, some of whom are in this room. Uh, outlines more than 50 different initiatives that accelerate affordable housing construction, protect tenants, and deliver more value from affordable housing investments. It is the most ambitious housing program ever undertaken by this or any other city or state. And I go back to the Koch housing plan, which was uh, revolutionary and in its time and had dramatic impacts on the city. Um, but this one is even more ambitious uh, than that. We envision that the total cost of the plan over the next 10 years will exceed $40 billion, with the city providing $8.2 billion and the remainder coming from the federal and state government, and most importantly, the bulk of it coming from private investment from many of you in this room. So we have to really make sure that we are creating a plan that is going to attract private investment. The city, however, is literally doubling its capital investment in housing, 
something you will hear a little bit more about when the city's uh, proposed budget is released on Thursday. 40% of the new 200,000 affordable units will be through new construction, which means that an average of 8,000 units of affordable housing per year will be new construction over the life of this plan. Now that's a 60% increase over the average annual new construction of affordable housing produced during Mayor Bloomberg's administration. So you can see that we are really setting for ourselves a very, very ambitious target. We are expanding the number of units for the extremely low income households by 200% compared to the Bloomberg administration program, as well as increasing the number of moderate income units by 50%. So we're broadening the bands of who will be eligible to participate in uh, getting apartments under the affordable housing program. The plan uh, also is promoting more units for homeless families, for seniors, as well as supportive and accessible housing. We recognize that for developers and businesses, time is money. The city, particularly city planning and HPD, are committed to making the permitting and approval process much more efficient. We are also reviewing zoning and building code regulations, such as reducing parking requirements in transit-oriented areas that have concentrations of affordable housing, where car ownership is low. We're looking at uh, revising building envelope constraints, which we hear from developers are overly constrained. Um, and minimum sizes of units for seniors, maybe reducing them in certain instances, all of which we believe can lower the cost of construction for you. But the key theme that runs through the plan is our commitment to expand the capacity for housing in all five boroughs by fostering diverse and livable neighborhoods. And as Carlo indicated, this is pretty much what I've spent the majority of my adult life doing. To fulfill this ambitious goal, the Department of City Planning, working with local elected officials, local businesses, and community organizations, will commence planning studies in 15 neighborhoods in all five boroughs in the coming year, where we believe the potential exists to greatly expand housing capacity. We recognize that this effort must be undertaken through ground-up community planning that coordinates new development with appropriate infrastructure and city services. City planning, working with other city agencies, including HPD and EDC, will play an enhanced role in the city's capital budget planning process in order to better mesh the level and timing of the city's capital investments in neighborhoods with new residential development. And some of you may remember, some of you who are as old as I am, may remember the days when city planning played a central role in capital budget planning. Um, that was not included in the Charter 1989 Charter uh, revisions, but we are going to be playing a much, much more active role in the future, which is critical to establishing and helping uh, grow neighborhoods that are lively, sustainable, and uh, where people uh, want to live. Um, now, let me... Um, Um, we recognize that this effort must be undertaken, all of this planning work must be undertaken through ground-up community planning that coordinates new development with appropriate infrastructure and city services. And let me provide a template to you how this can work. For the past two years, our Brooklyn office, under the direction of the super-capable Purnam Kapoor, who you all know, has been engaged in a planning process with the community in East New York, a vibrant multicultural neighborhood that has been left behind even as many other parts of Brooklyn have thrived. This transit-rich area offers an easy 30-minute commute to Lower Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn and east to the JFK and Long Island via the Long Island Railroad. 
Our planners under Purnima's direction have been out in the community meeting with all stakeholders and listening to their hopes and their vision for their community in close partnership with elected officials, community members, business leaders, and the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. We have developed a framework for growth and revitalization that can create an opportunity for thousands of units of new affordable housing, much needed retail, jobs, and services, and that also addresses the physical infrastructure needs of the area. We have been engaged with our sister city agencies to ensure that our planning work comprehensively addresses infrastructure and service needs, access to jobs and training, and ensures that the people in the community can continue to be partners in the revitalization of their own neighborhood. We believe East New York now welcomes increased density because it understands the benefits it can bring. But we also understand the city's obligation to produce the timely infrastructure and services increased density requires. That's our deal. We want to be able to match infrastructure improvements to increased density. Just as our deal with the development community is we're going to demand, as you'll hear in a minute, uh, certain things from the developers, but at the same time, we're committed to reducing your costs and the time of processing. We will similarly engage in, with communities throughout Brooklyn and the other boroughs to identify other opportunities for growth and redevelopment. We will work toward shared goals of providing new housing options, necessary services, and economic development opportunities throughout the borough and the city. We will also implement, this is another part of our deal, a mandatory inclusionary zoning requirement as part of all future rezonings that substantially increase potential housing capacity in medium and high density areas. This will require that a portion of the new housing developed in these rezoned areas to be permanently affordable to low or moderate income households in order to ensure diverse and inclusive communities and to cushion the impacts of gentrification. And to the borough president's point, um, mandatory inclusionary zoning, inclusionary zoning is one avenue to permanent affordability. And in that respect, it is also not only produces units, but produces permanent affordability. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important. The program will be applicable in all medium and high density districts where rezonings provide an opportunity for significantly more housing. So on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, mandatory inclusionary housing will be implemented everywhere as we rezone. It will not necessarily be exactly the same in each such neighborhood, but within each neighborhood, once enacted, it will be predictable, it will be as of right, and it will be required. City planning working with HPD will immediately initiate and expedite the completion of a study to provide the foundation in land use policy for incorporating a mandatory inclusionary zoning program into our zoning resolution. And that work literally starts today. We gave the staff yesterday off for that. Um, we will also be looking at underutilized land where housing opportunities may exist. And in this regard, I just want to talk very, very briefly about manufacturing. Um, I recognize, and I certainly know, and I'm very sensitive to through my days at uh, EDC, that some manufacturing areas in Brooklyn and indeed elsewhere in the city are sacrosanct. Um, the nature of, our, of those of manufacturing activities and jobs in these areas require that they remain as exclusive precincts where other incompatible uses must be prohibited or severely restricted. But I also believe that for too long, indeed for the last 70 years since the end of World War II, the city's manufacturing policy in effect has been defensive. It has been one of attempting to slow the rate of manufacturing decline. And it's really time now to go on the offense. Brooklyn has been 
in the forefront of a new wave of manufacturing and tech industry advances that have started to reverse the trend of disinvestment in our manufacturing areas. In 2012, tech industry occupied 1.7 million square feet of space in the Brooklyn Tech Triangle area, Dumbo, Brooklyn Navy Yard, downtown Brooklyn, with 9,600 employees. We estimate that the existing tech companies will double in size, occupying 3.1 million square feet with 18,000 employees in the next few years. The success of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and Dumbo has spurred new development, new investment and in energy in many of the industrial areas in Brooklyn from Sunset Park to Williamsburg and Gowanus. Uniquely Brooklyn commercial enterprises like 1000 Dean Street and Crown Heights, the Yard co-working space in Williamsburg's uh, north side, uh, Acumen's Pfizer incubator in Bed-Stuy and Industry City and the Brooklyn Army Terminal, something that's very dear to my heart, in Sunset Park, are pushing the boundaries of the tech and creative scene beyond the inner ring and are capitalizing on the overwhelming success of Dumbo and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's time to recognize the dynamic changes in these kinds of new manufacturing businesses, ones that have discovered the locational advantages of staying in New York City. It's time to create the physical and business environment that would allow these businesses to achieve their full potential to grow and thrive. And in order to accommodate this growth, the public and private sector must join forces to find appropriate geographic areas for these businesses and to revise our land use policies accordingly. In my view, some manufacturing high-tech businesses are not incompatible with workforce housing. Indeed, manufacturing and workforce housing, uh, in some circumstances, can be mutually reinforcing. Co-location can reduce stress on our infrastructure requirements by providing opportunities for workers to live near their jobs and create the kind of physical environment, including enhanced retail, that will make manufacturing areas more appealing to those who work there. We must continue to welcome manufacturing innovation and work jointly with businesses and communities to ensure that our neighborhoods are vibrant, mixed-use communities providing both jobs and housing options to all income groups. And I think one of the major changes that have taken place in land use policy over the last few decades is the reduction in segregated neighborhoods by use and a recognition that the healthiest neighborhoods tend to be mixed-use neighborhoods. And I know that many of you in this room have uh, ideas that uh, can be brought forth um, that can help implement that and, uh, and, and continue that discussion. Um, moving forward, city planning will continue to engage communities, especially those that have been left behind in the last decade, in reimagining and strengthening their neighborhoods based on a shared vision of opportunity. We will meet with neighborhood residents, civic and business leaders, as well as elected officials in making sure that our plans for future growth are based upon the real needs and aspirations of the people who live there. I welcome the real estate and development community to be our partners in realizing this shared goal of a strong and vibrant Brooklyn that continues to embrace newcomers while keeping what makes the boroughs strong and desirable, its people, its diverse and beautiful neighborhoods strong. Thank you so much. Thank you.